Grace Church, happy Easter. He is risen. Will you guys stand with us as we sing and celebrate this morning? It may be cold and rainy outside, but in here it is nothing short of that. Father, your presence is here. So we declare these songs, Lord, that you are risen. You are risen indeed, King of kings. Hallelujah. Sing this with me, Man of Sorrows. Man of sorrows, Lamb of God, by his own betrayed the sin of man. Silent as he stood accused. Silent as he stood accused. Beaten, marked, and scored. Bowing to the Father's will, he took a crown of thorns. And so for that, Father, we thank you. Let's sing, oh, that rugged cross. And oh, that rugged cross, my salvation. Where your love poured out over me. Now my soul, now my soul cries out. Hallelujah, praise and honor. Sing. Sent of heaven, God's own Son, to purchase and redeem and reconcile. the precious blood that my Jesus spilled. Now the curse of sin has no hold on me. Whom the Son sets free, oh, is free indeed. Now my debt is paid, it is paid in full by the precious blood. My Jesus, let my Jesus live. Whom the Son, the Son sets free. Oh, is free indeed. Oh, that I cross my salvation. Where your love poured out over me. The stone is rolled away. Come on. Behold the empty. Let's declare, sing hallelujah.
It's your name and your name alone, Lord, that we can stand on. Our firm foundation, Jesus. You alone, Jesus. In Christ alone. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. In this cornerstone, you say, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought. What heights? What heights of love? What depths of peace? When fears are still, when striving cease, my comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ, I'll stand. the power of Christ. Yeah, let's raise our voice. We sing from life's first cry to final breath. Jesus commands my destiny. No power, no power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he Till he returns, till he returns, or calls me home, here in the power of Christ, I'll stand, here in 
the power of Christ we stand. Can we give him true praise? True praise. Lift his name high. Come on. I know we can do more than that. Father, you are risen. You are risen, Lord. You are risen, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. In Jesus' name, we all said. Amen. Thank you, guys. Amen. Welcome to Grace Church, everyone. I'm going to ask everyone to take a seat, including our children today, because we have a very special treat for Easter. Uh, my name is Liz Rush. I'm the communications director here, and I'm excited. Um, you'll see in just a moment some outstanding performers are going to be coming on stage and these beautiful children are from our very own Grace Kids Preschool. Here at Grace Church, we do have a preschool that adjoins our church. And um, they are an early education facility. And we get blessed by them twice a year. <laughs> we usually get a performance on Christmas and Easter. And it is one of our favorite things here at Grace Church. So as they're getting set up, uh, go ahead and find your seats. Uh, we will be releasing our kids to the kids' ministry after this performance, but we wanted them to get a chance to see it. So why don't we all put our hands together for Grace Kids Preschool.
One more time for Grace Kids Preschool. <laughs> Guys, too. Well, everyone, it doesn't get any cuter than that. <laughs> I would like to ask everyone now um, to stand. We're going to release all of our children back to our Sunday school teachers who are waiting in the lobby. And I invite everyone to stand and just welcome someone next to you. Say hello, say good morning, and happy Easter. All right. Well, that was quite the way to start out the day. That makes up for the rain, right? <laughs> All right. Well, I'd like to welcome everyone once again to Grace. Uh, my name is Liz Rush. I'm the communications director here, and we are so glad that you're joining us here on Easter Sunday. Uh, we just want to welcome you. If you're visiting for the first time, if you're new, maybe you had a child in the preschool performance, or you're just visiting with family or friends, we'd like to just say welcome to you. We would love to meet you and help you uh, get plugged in here at Grace. We have an info booth right outside Hangar Right, covered with a tent today. <laughs> and we have a gift for you, and we would love to just tell you more about Grace Church and how to get into one of our house churches or how to get involved here at Grace. You can also check out the QR codes on the very back of our chair. That's our sort of our one stop Stop shop connection card and if you um, scan that and fill that out that will go straight to us and we will reach out to you with more information about whatever it is you want to get involved in. So um, we're just so glad you're here with us today. I would like to tell you about two things that are happening next Sunday. We would love for you to come back next Sunday. Uh, one of those things is our newcomer's lunch. So we do a newcomer's lunch um, every couple months here at Grace. And this is uh, especially for anyone who is brand new. So if you are you know, attending for the first time today, or even if you've been coming for a couple months, but maybe you haven't gotten completely plugged in yet, the newcomer's lunch is next Sunday on April uh, 7th. We are doing it after the third service, so after the 11.30 service, right around 12.30 when we release, and uh, we feed you lunch, and then we have a pastor and a couple of the staff come and just present a little bit about the church, answer a lot of your questions, get to know you, we do a QA, and a and it's just a great time to learn more about Grace Church and see if it's a place that you would like to call home. So we encourage you all to come to that next Sunday. You can actually register for it in advance at gracesd.com slash events. And another awesome thing happening next Sunday is our annual ministry fair. Here at Grace, um, we have our house churches, which is our, our way to build community and get to know one another during the week. But we also have ministries, and we want to make sure everybody knows about those. We have ministries for hanging out, but also for outreach, also for care and recovery um, and addiction and all sorts of things. And so next week, um, what a treat. There is no rain in the forecast, <laughs> and there will be tables outside after all of our services. And there's going to be um, people there that can answer your questions about all of our different ministries here at Grace. You can also check them out. You can get a sneak peek if you want at gracesd.com slash ministries. All right. Well, um, before we introduce uh, Pastor Josh, we would love for you to turn your attention to the screen. Tim Tebow is a strong Christian. For God so loved the world. The whole world. That Tebow passed for exactly 316 yards. Everyone. Anyone. Believes in him. The Nielsen TV rating audience was exactly 31.6%. Don't tell me to start. I have so many questions. That he gave his one and only son. Who believes in him not life we have eternal life wow. 
a sort of kingdom that a person cannot see unless he is born again. Born again? Yes. Hey, good morning, Grace Church. How are you? Happy Easter. You guys look good, smell good, sound good. It's good to be with you. Uh, my name is Josh. I'm one of the pastors here. And um, I, I, I don't know if we know each other that well, but like, don't judge me. I want to confess something to you. Uh, don't judge me. On Valentine's Day of this year, my wife Amy and I took our children out of school so that we could go to Disneyland. <laughs> yeah, I know. Some of you are like, don't like me anymore. I get it. But we went up to Anaheim early, got a hotel, stayed the night, woke up, got coffee. We're trying to be there like right around the rope drop time. And it is like we're having a good day. We're walking up. My kids are wearing their princess gear. The ears are on. Love is in the air. People are smiling and dancing. This is awesome. But as we get closer to the entrance, we can hear something over a loudspeaker, someone speaking. As you get closer to the sound, you see a big sign that says John 316 on the sign. And you can start to hear what this person is saying, and it's like, uh-oh. I mean, this is a preacher who's giving some fire and brimstone kind of stuff. And I'm like, I'm a preacher. I love that verse. What's he talking about? Uh, but it is very much repent, you sinners. God is going to judge you. Everything is wrong, and you are wrong. And it's 7 a.m., and we're walking into the happiest place on earth. <laughs> and this brother is coming in hot, uh, saying, turn or burn, you sinners, and there's a dad, there's a dad walking next to me with a stroller, he's got a daughter in a stroller, and he just strolls by me and he says, just out of nowhere, he says, uh, no better way to start the morning than having someone tell you you're going to hell, and just keeps walking, and I'm like, sir, come back, I know the rest of the story, come here, <laughs> like, let's ride rides together, no, um, he's gone, he's gone. Uh, this verse, this beautiful verse that many of us have memorized has become an SNL skit, it's on The Simpsons, it's, it's out there in the world, radically misunderstood. And so I wanted to talk about it this morning. This verse comes in the context of a conversation Jesus has with a religious leader who's probably uncomfortable meeting Jesus in public, so he goes to Jesus late at night, and they have a conversation, and that's where this verse comes from. So if you know this, would you say it with me? We're going to put it on the screen, so no judgment, but repeat with me. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. I heard some whosoever's in there. Anybody? It's like deep from your like King, King James version. It's hard to shake the KJV. It's like in there. Whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. In one sentence, you get the whole story. So let's walk through this sentence together. Uh, God so loved. Theologian A.W. Tozer famously said, the most important thing about a person is what they think of when they think of God. Where does your mind go when you start to think about God? God so loved. In this verse, God is not an impersonal force. He's not a far-off deity uninterested in the affairs of people. God in this verse is doing something, and he's not yelling. He's not scorekeeping He's not disappointed. He's not passive, aggressive. He's not withholding love. Rather, he is giving love. And it's not just regular love. The text says he is so loving, which is different than just regular loving. You know, if you're a parent, like you love all your kids, but you so love your favorite kid. Like, you know what I'm talking about? You're like, I love you guys, but you. <laughs> so love you. For those of you who don't have kids, you think that's a terrible thing to say, just wait, just wait. <laughs> I remember being at a youth camp, and the preacher told the story, he's like, God loves you so much, if God had a refrigerator, your picture would be on the fridge. And I was like, that's kind of silly, but as I've gotten older, I'm like, wow, that's really beautiful that <laughs> God would have my picture on his fridge, that's so kind. God is the all-powerful creator of the universe, currently sustaining all things, and this God is so loving. Why? Why? Well, it's pretty simple. It's because it's who he is, and it's what we most need. God is so loving because it's who he is, and it's what we most need. This may be hard for you, but listen. We were created looking for love and attachment. 
Research shows that babies that aren't loved and hugged and kissed and cuddled and given eye contact can actually stop growing. Not having love can hinder your growth. Infants who aren't loved have developmental pauses in their brain, causing a risk of behavioral and emotional and social problems. You and I were created for love and secure attachment with God. We are on a quest to be loved. Now, some of you came here today for Easter church, and that's great, but you also came here scoping and hoping for love. Single people, am I right? This is a great place. Let's just, let's just be honest. Let's play matchmaker right now. If you're looking for love, would you just raise your hand real quick? Just stand up. Look around, everyone. This is a great place to find a lifelong partner. I'm just kidding. Relax. Uh, but though, it's, it could happen. Um, <laughs> we, we may call it acceptance or identity or security or whatever, but all of that's a big funnel, and at the bottom of it's love. When you're posting on social media, you're not looking for likes. You're looking for love. When you're in the gym working on your arms, fellas, don't forget leg day, like you are looking for love. When you call your parents, you're looking for love. When you work hard to achieve something, you want to receive Love, what you do in college, what you do for work is often driven by love. Some of us have gone back to people who hurt us because we wanted to be loved. We have gone great lengths for love. We could do just about anything to be loved. In 1993, a singer named Meatloaf wrote a song about this. First question is, does Meatloaf not have any friends that would tell him the name Meatloaf is not a good band name? I don't know, but they let him go, and he wrote a song called, I Would Do Anything for Love, But I Won't Do That. For those of us over 30, we know this song. If you're younger than 30, go Google it and feel uncomfortable later. But to this day, nobody knows what was too far for meatloaf. What was the deal breaker for meatloaf? There's a Wikipedia page designated to answering this question. Church, there are two big questions in the world. Why am I here on this earth, and what is it that meatloaf won't do for love? John 3.16 says, God is offering us what we most need. And it's not generic, superficial love. It's an intimate love, a love that knows you. Because the verse goes on to say, not just God so loved, but he loves something. And that something is the world. And when the Bible says the world, it doesn't mean the globe physically. It means the, the great mass of fallen and rebellious humanity who cannot save themselves. We are fallen and rebellious. The world is God's enemy. That is me and that's you. From the Garden of Eden, we have failed to trust God. We have fallen short of his glory. He gave us the Ten Commandments. And if you were to read them and I were to read them, you would find that you are a 10 out of 10 commandment breaker. We are sinners. We are imperfect. We struggle And sometimes this truth of being a sinner can make you feel disqualified from God's love. I've been a pastor for a few years, and I've heard God say this. I've heard people say this to me over and over. God can't love me. I'm too sinful. I'm too angry. I'm too hurt. I've hurt too many people. I've slept with too many people. I struggle with addiction. I've gone too far. I drink too much. I'm too unlovable. I did this or I did that. God couldn't want me. Listen, you know that God knows that about you, right? God knows everything about you, yet his posture, his action, his heart towards you is so loving. And his love is not like ours. Dane Ortland in his book, Gentle and Lowly, says Jesus does not love like us. We love until we're betrayed. Jesus continued to the cross despite betrayal. We love until we're forsaken. Jesus loved through forsakenness. We love to a limit. Jesus loves to the end. The church, when you think about God, try to allow your mind to go to this thought. He knows me and still so loves me. He knows me and still so loves me. Maybe, maybe you're here and you're a skeptic and you're like, I don't know, Pastor, like, that sounds like a lot. Are you sure about that? Well, the, the sentence goes on to say what proves his love. For God so loved the world that he does something. He gives something. He gave his one and only son. God's love is not vague, sentimental, or random. It is a love that gives, a love that's willing to pay a cost. God's love is sacrificial. God says through his actions, I see you, I know you, I understand, and we are at odds with one another, but I'm going to be the one to make it right. The Bible calls this message the gospel. 
The gospel is the good news that God loved you in your helpless and rebellious state and self-sacrificed on your behalf. Romans chapter 5 verse 8 takes John 3.16 and sums it up and says, But God demonstrated his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God did not wait for you to clean up first. He didn't wait for you to get your act together. He didn't wait for you to fix yourself. He saw you and knew you in your helpless state and said, I love you. I know you. I'm willing to sacrifice for you while you are my enemy. He puts himself in your place. The gospel story is the most beautiful, profound, life-altering message in the world. It's the greatest story ever told. And every story that's any good often echoes the gospel. This is why we have a hard time holding it together in a movie that shows self-sacrificial love because it's an echo of the gospel. You most want someone who knows you and loves you and is willing to sacrifice for you. Sacrificial love in a story moves us. I brought some stories, and I I brought enough of them to I think we're going to cover everyone today. Stories of self-sacrificial love. Uh, Right off the top, we'll go with this one. Have you guys seen Titanic? Yeah? Yeah? You know there was room on the door for Jack to be next to her, right? Like, (laughs) Rose was being a little selfish, can we be honest? But Jack willingly sacrifices for Rose, and that moves us. This next movie ruined a generation. If you have seen Armageddon, you did not recover from the scene when Bruce Willis takes Ben Affleck up to the moment and then trades spots with him, and through the glass says, no, it's my turn, you go take care of my daughter. Like, we were, we were struggling for weeks after that movie, just walking around with our heads down, like, how could he do that? Wow. I don't know if you've seen uh, this movie, but spoiler alert, everybody dies in Rogue One. Everybody dies. Therefore, making it one of the top five Star Wars movies ever made, I will fight you on that. Everybody sacrifices so that they can get the blueprints to the Death Star off to the next teams. Tony Stark in Endgame. You remember this moment? Yeah, when he has to self-sacrifice to defeat Thanos, then Captain America thinks he's all alone, the Black Panther and the crew come walking through the circle. Are you kidding me? The reason you're crying is because of the gospel, believe it or not. Remember when Katniss volunteers as tribute so her little sister Primrose doesn't have to go into the arena? Yeah, I volunteer as tribute. Like, I've heard that before. Maybe you're into literature. Do you remember when Dumbledore dies for Harry? Yeah, and Snape did it. Are you kidding me? (laughs) Snape long-gamed us the whole way. It's crazy. Remember when Aslan died for Edmund in the Chronicles of Narnia? Now, this one's cheating because C.S. Lewis was trying to tell a different story by using this story. That's profound and it's powerful. I have have kind of a hidden one here. This is a movie called John Q. Did anyone see this? 2002 classic. Denzel Washington's son, nine years old, has a heart condition. He's not going to get a heart transplant on time, so Denzel holds the whole hospital hostage, takes a doctor into the room and says, I'm going to sacrifice myself. You have to promise me that you'll take my heart and give it to my son. Crazy movie. Don't go watch that. (laughs) This next one, we can all agree, changed our life. (laughs) When Anna sacrificed herself for Elsa, are you kidding me? But I think the most gut-wrenching story of self-sacrifice ever written outside of the gospel of Jesus Christ is from the movie Inside Out. Do you remember this scene? I can't even think about it right now. (laughs) That's Joy. She's the emotion inside of Riley's head. And that's Bing Bong, Riley's imaginary friend. And they're stuck in the abyss. And the only way they're going to get out of the abyss is if one of them jumps off the wagon. And on the last moment, Bing Bong jumps off the wagon, allowing Riley to have joy. And I watched that with my kids. And my daughters are like, Dad, why are you sobbing? And I'm like, (laughs) because Bing Bong goes to the abyss so Riley can have joy. Bing Bong is Jesus. (laughs) Like, the best stories echo the gospel. They resonate with us so Deeply, because God's truth is buried in our bones. Everyone being moved by these stories is being moved by the gospel that we're known and loved and sacrificed for. John 3.16 has every right to be on a sign outside of Disney. It's the best news in the world. Disney owes John 3.16 copyright infringement, like pay, because it's all the same story. God loves you enough to sacrifice for you. 
And he sacrifices his one and only son. There's only one who could do it, and that one was willing to do it. Well, the question is, do what? What was the sacrifice for? Let's keep reading. God loved the world so much, he gave his only son, that whosoever believes should not perish, but have eternal life. The sacrifice is so that we would believe he loves us and be saved from perishing. I sacrifice for you so that you would believe I love you and be saved from perishing. Now, here's the hard part, church. God loves you enough to sacrifice for you. He also loves you enough to tell you the truth. And the truth is, your sin, it doesn't make you bad. Your sin makes you dead. And because you and I are dead in our sin, there are two options. Perish in disbelief or live in belief. There's no third option. It's simple, but it is difficult. Believe in Jesus and live eternally or reject Jesus and perish eternally. This invitation is for right now and for later. You either have right, life right now and continue to have life eternally or you have death right now and continue to live in death eternally. You either are with God now and eternally or you reject God now and eternally. So let me be clear. God is not judging us eternally on some standard of being a good person or a bad person or a kind person or an unkind person. He's judging us solely on our relationship to Jesus. And Nicodemus, the Pharisee who's talking to Jesus, has a very hard time understanding this. He cannot get it in his head that this is the new design. So Jesus boils it down for him and says, Nicodemus, there is one requirement to inherit eternal life. And that one requirement is you must be born again. Born again. As though the first birth was into death. And now we need to be reborn into life. This is what the Apostle Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2, but because of his great love for us, because he so loved us, the God who is rich in mercy made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in our transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. You were dead, but God made you alive. That's the gospel, that Jesus didn't come into the world to make bad people good. He came into the world to make dead people alive. That's the story of Easter that the dead can be raised, that nothing is impossible, that no one is too far gone, that what happened to Jesus can happen to us. We can be free from death and pain and sorrow and the grave. And it's the best news in the world. And most people stop at John 3.16 and they they don't go on to see Jesus' strategy to achieve this in John 3.17. The next verse says, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Condemnation in the Bible is a legal standing. It means there's a verdict pronounced over you. It means that you are guilty before a righteous judge. And Jesus said, I didn't come to the world to condemn you. If you went to lunch with Jesus today, he wouldn't pull out a list of sins and say, I'm glad we're getting burritos for lunch today because I've been meaning to talk to you about this laundry list of things that you are guilty for. No, that's, that's not it at all. He shows up as a savior who is kind, a king who stands up for you against your real enemy, which is sin and death and the devil. There's a story of this in the gospel that's like a microchasm of the macro thing God is doing. In one of the gospels, Jesus is teaching his disciples and some Pharisees, some people like Nicodemus, teachers of the law. They find a woman caught in adultery. Now, don't ask me how they find her. They're scoping this thing out. But they find a woman caught in adultery, and they bring her before Jesus. Not the man, just the woman. And they bring her before. And they say, Jesus, they're trying to trap him. This woman was caught in the act. The law says we stone her. What do you say? And Jesus just starts writing in the dirt. With the body. He's just like, doesn't he? Just drawing in the dirt. Nobody knows. He's drawing a little sunshine. He's drawing like their sin. He's just drawing in the dirt. And then eventually he tells the religious leaders, uh, how about if any of you is without sin, you be the first one to throw the stone. And one by one, from the oldest to the youngest, they drop their stones and walk away until only Jesus is left with this woman. And then Jesus says to her, where are they that condemn you? She says, no one's left. And Jesus responds, neither do I condemn you. Now go and leave your life of sin. The sinless one, Jesus, the one who has every right to judge everyone, says to her, I didn't come here to throw stones at you. 
I came here to take stones for you. I am here to provide something greater than what's being offered by these Pharisees. It's a kindness that leads to repentance, a covering that leads to repentance. So church, please hear me. Jesus doesn't want to condemn you. He wants to take condemnation for you. Your sin condemns you, not Jesus. You don't need more shame. You need a healer. You don't need more evidence of your failure. You need to know, can someone save? You don't need some guy yelling at you on the way to Disneyland that you're going to hell. You need to know if anyone can do anything about the state of our souls. And Jesus says, I can. I can do something about that. I can cover you from all of the condemnation of sin. I can take death for you. I can take hell for you. I will be your covering. The law was ready to throw rocks at this woman, and Jesus says, I will cover her, which is the whole story of the Bible in a nutshell. God covered Adam and Eve in the garden when they sinned and walked away from him. In the Exodus story, when death is coming for the people, God provides the blood of a lamb. And what does it do? It covers them so that death passes over them. Christ has become the once and for all shelter and covering for those who believe. Therefore, those who are born again now stand under the covering of Christ. And there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ When you are covered by Christ and condemnation comes knocking and the guilty verdict comes knocking, it doesn't find you anymore. It finds Jesus. And there is nothing in Jesus that has ever been sinful or broken or against God's will. Therefore, what he had has been gifted to you. Therefore, the verdict of your life has changed. You're not guilty anymore. You're born again to righteousness to holiness, to right standing before God. John 3.16 on Easter is so fitting because the resurrection is the promise that new new birth is available to the whole world. My favorite detail about the resurrection is that it happens in a tomb located in a garden. And I think God did this on purpose because Easter is God showing the world that he's reversing the curse of everything. Because where did death enter the world for the first time? The Garden of Eden. So where does life enter the world for the first time? The Garden Tomb. Everything that died in the Garden of Eden was born again in the Garden Tomb. Everything that was broken in the Garden of Eden has been born again in the Garden Tomb. Everything that was cursed in the Garden of Eden is born again in the Garden Tomb. Everything in our lives that is dead and can't be fixed is now born again in the garden tomb. And the Bible calls resurrected Jesus the first fruit of new creation, meaning that Christ has now ushered in a kingdom and says, anyone with any background can join me in this kingdom. There is one requirement. You must be born again. You must be born again. So how do you get born again? Well, let's go back to this verse. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. My favorite part of that verse is the word whosoever. That means anyone. That means everyone. That means no matter how dark your past is, no matter how dark your current struggles are, Jesus is saying anyone and everyone who wants to be born again can receive freely the gift of new life. You don't have to fix yourself. Just surrender to me. I can, br- I can break the chains of all the stuff that's killing you. I can fix all the things that are breaking you. The resurrection proves that Jesus can, in fact, give new birth. And he does want to offer that to the world. Believe in Jesus, surrender to Jesus, and he will make you a new creation. In fact, Jesus says he will make all things new. This morning we get to celebrate baptism, which is so beautiful because this is a picture of being born again. You get in the water and you outwardly display to the world publicly what happened to you inwardly. That you have inwardly died and been risen again in your heart. And you get in the water and you go under burying your old self. Symbolically being raised to walk in new life. Baptism is a picture of being born again. 
So John 3.16 offers an invitation to the world, and baptism shows the fruit of that invitation. And so church, this morning, I want to ask you, have you been born again? Because God would so love to save you. God would so love to give you the gift of new life. God would so love for you to walk out of church today not carrying all the pain and sorrow of death and sin. He would so love to make you born again. He would so love for you to get in the baptism water and get dunked and walk out and have new life. And the good news is, yesterday, the baptism was leaking, so we had to restart the water, so it's freezing cold. (laughs) It's going to really feel like being born again. A girl after the 8.30 service said, I never felt more alive. And I'm like, yeah, that's what a cold plunge in Jesus will do for you, my friend. We got towels. We got t-shirts. If you came today and you just thought you were coming to church and you want to leave born again, that's on the table. It doesn't matter your past. It doesn't matter your struggles. The invitation is whosoever, anybody. The invitation is anybody. And God would so love for you to respond to him. So I'm going to pray, and the band's going to come up, and we're going to start celebrating baptism, and we're going to see physically a picture of what it means to be spiritually born again. And we're going to celebrate, and you're invited to join us this morning. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your word that tells us you did everything necessary for us to be saved. You did everything imaginable for us to be saved. God, I pray this morning, as people here, we would would respond to you, we would hear you, God, that your spirit right now would, would weigh heavy on people's hearts, would show people that they are dead in their sins and they need to be made alive in Christ. God, I pray against any fear, any worry, and I just pray that we would surrender to you, God. Father, help us be a people of surrender. We trust you, Lord. We love you, Lord. And we ask you to do what only you can do this morning, which is raise the dead. Sermons can't do that. Songs can't do that. Only the power of the Holy Spirit can raise the dead. So Holy Spirit, we ask that you would show your power this morning in our hearts. God, move us again by the story of the gospel. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. And Grace Church, will you stand with us as we begin?
anyone in here at all, outside, in the NPR, wherever you may be in this church, if you feel a nudge from the Spirit that's calling you to do this, as scary as it may seem, the fear that you feel inside has no match to the closeness you have with Jesus. So if anyone feels a tugging in their spirit, you want to get baptized, we're giving you that space. So we got a few minutes left, we got a couple more, and if you're on the fence, here to support you. Right. 
got more coming up. We're going to keep singing until we're done. <laughs> you are worthy of it all. There's not much else to say, church. Thank you for those that came to support. Thank you for the act of obedience that you guys made. Church, thank you for being with us today. He is risen. Let's celebrate that today as we leave here. Have a wonderful week, and we'll see you guys next time. Take care.
Sometimes on this journey, I get lost in my mistakes. It looks to me like weakness is a canvas for your strength. And my story isn't over, and my story's just begun. And failure won't define me, cause that's what my f
Stars they led, the morning sun was dead, the savior of the world was fallen, his body on the cross, his blood. 